I want to um, welcome all of you um, to this afternoon, to the time for the sermon, and um, wish us all a happy and blessed Sabbath together. And now um, I will just, just quickly bow my head for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to be together with all of the brothers and sisters at Salisbury. And um, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be with all of us. We ask for your word to be clear, especially give me, Lord, um, clarity of mind and fluidity of mind to allow you to speak. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay. I'll just, um, um, one second. Sorry. So, um, yes, good morning, everybody. I am very humbled to be sharing a message with you today. Um, I don't think, I remember what Brother Johnny said two weeks ago when he preached, it is a and an awesome um, responsibility to break the word. And I am by no means a seasoned preacher. So um, the only the only thing I have is faith in God. But I'm I'm very privileged and thankful to to have the opportunity. So um, I pray that. What I feel the Lord has laid on my heart to share with you today is it will be a help to everyone. Um, but at the very least, even to someone, someone would be a blessing. Personally, um, it is, it's been a big issue for me. Um, I've come across this thing in the past and it really spent, sent my head into a tis was so it came up again for me recently, and um, I'm lucky because I've been there before, and I went through the process of, of worrying and stressing and panicking and praying, and God gave me peace in my heart. He said, just just be, be at peace. When you need to know something, I'll tell you, and I put it aside, and it was fine. So um, it's come up again now, and I thought this is, this is important to talk about, so that's why... Um, I've I've decided, or hopefully God has told me to speak about this with you today. So um, maybe many of you have already thought about what I'm going to talk about because maybe the same thing comes up for you or it has come up. Um, and maybe you practice the things that I'm going to talk about. Um, but wherever you are in your situation, I'm going to be asking you some questions. And I would like you to think seriously about the questions I ask. Think about them in relation to you, yourself, because they're for each one of you to think about in your own life. So there are questions arising right now around us, many questions, and some of them are extremely important. Questions that are calling our beliefs into question, Lots of the attacks are from preachers and scholars outside of the church. They are Bible people, they know their stuff. And as as um, Johnny just mentioned in the prayer, I think it was Johnny or Heather, but one of you said the wolves are getting fiercer. We can see this. The wolves are attacking. And I don't know if you've noticed, but they are specifically, many of them, attacking the Seventh-day Adventist church, attacking Ellen White, and attacking certain beliefs. There's a Seventh-day Adventist, his name is um, Ken Horst, and he addresses all of these, these men usually it is, I don't think I've heard a woman yet, but all of these men, um, he addresses what they say, he, he goes through it with a fine tooth comb, and I really appreciate this man because he, he gives a, a response to these people. And um, I'm glad for him. He corrects many misconceptions about our faith. The one that I think is most prevalent is a claim that people make. They say that everyone, they say that we say, or we believe that everybody who worships on Sunday has the mark of the beast. 
But we know that's totally not true. It's only when Sunday becomes a legislated forced worship that it will then be the mark of the beast. So yes, it's really sad to hear these false attacks and I'm grateful someone can clarify that. It's even more sad when we hear the way they talk about Ellen White sometimes. There was a man called, I think it was Mari Emmanuel. He's an orthodox and he was really disrespectfully basically calling her a mad woman. Um, but, you know, we have we shouldn't be saddened about this because what it is doing more than anything is standing as a marker for us. It should bring into our focus and make us aware of the time we are living in. Yeah, the more this happens, the, the closer we see that we are getting to the times of trouble. So my first question to you is just about that. Do you recognize the time? Do you see it? Now, just think about this for a minute. Yeah. We know the parable of the fig tree and the signs have been fulfilled all along hundreds of years. They've been fulfilling now. But when you see the current signs that are happening around us, they're revealing where we are. And I want to ask you, or I want you to ask yourself, have they changed your focus in your life? Do these signs affect your perspective on your lifespan? Do they affect your plans, your goals? If they haven't, please take some time to consider that. There are also lots of questions arising from within our church. Unfortunately, the church seems to be reaching a point of pressure such that if it continues on this path, it would be inevitable that it will fracture and split. And if you haven't come into contact with some of these internal questions, or I would even call them conundrums, then I believe you surely will at some time. They're not going anywhere. So the likelihood is that you will know someone who's very passionate about certain thoughts and they might want to share some information with you on some important issues. And this, I'm not going to talk about what the issues are. Probably lots of you have different ideas or maybe experiences. But the point is that this is coming up. And at the very least, it can make you feel inspired to look into it and to decide where you stand. This is a good thing. If this is the case, it definitely won't seem an easy task for the majority of us. And this is where I said in the past, a good friend of mine started to talk to me about certain things. And I thought I, I started to look at it and I felt completely overwhelmed. I felt like I had to go back to the very origins of the patriarchs and understand where everything's come from. And it was just too much. But God fortunately answered me and, and gave me peace. So. Um, I'm saying this because we know we have to study the word of God to find ourselves approved. We do need to do this. We need to know where we stand. But the thing is, we're so busy with so much on the go, work, family, church, helping people where we can, um, things going wrong that we have to fix in our life, evangelizing to people, researching other things. And when it comes to finding out what the Bible says, there are so many people who've done it before us. They're good, they're good scholars. We trust their ability. They've made it their life calling to do this work. So why not just read what they say? Why not listen to what they've already figured out? Wouldn't that make it so much easier for me not to have to rethink all the difficult thinking they've already done? Surely it's not harmful to just benefit from their work. And besides, they're good at it. They have a talent for understanding the word of God. They've studied it. So why not just rely on what they've uncovered? And better still, why not just listen to their thinking? While I'm getting on with what I have to do, so much of my busy stuff can be happening and being done while I'm listening and absorbing all of their hard work. I can, till, I can kill two birds with one stone. Excuse me. Unfortunately, 
as easy and helpful and useful as this all sounds with all the technology we have available to us, we are strongly counseled against the easier way of digesting truth. And I'd like to read a quote for you. It's from the Testimonies to the Church, 109, paragraph 4. So, and the testimony says, We must study the truth for ourselves. No man should be relied upon to think for us, no matter who he is or in what position he may be placed. We are not to look upon any man as a criterion for us. We are to counsel together and to be subject to one another. But at the same time, we are to exercise the ability God has given us in order to learn what is truth. Each one of us must look to God for divine enlightenment. We must individually develop a character that will stand the test in the day of God. We must individually develop a character that stands the test in the day of God. We must not become set in our ideas. We must be open and flexible and think that no one should interfere with our opinions. So Sister White said it's imperative that we get advice from God. We get divine enlightenment in order to be able to stand in the trials. She said we must look to God for divine help. She's corroborating Isaiah chapter 118, which says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And the verses that follow that show that the reasoning is what happens between you and God. God invites us into his word to reason with him and to get understanding. The next question I have for you. Where do you think we are in the time span of Earth's history? Are we very likely to be close to the limit of time, brothers and sisters? Do we have time to rely on anyone else to give us the answers we need now? How do we know the Spirit has led them into the truth, the truth that they're standing on? Shouldn't we use all the time we have to get assurance for what we believe in the fact that we got our answers from the source of truth. The answers are there. They are in the word. And that's where other people are getting them from. We're lacking something, excuse me, important when we don't attempt to go and find the answers ourselves. We don't trust God and we don't believe his advice to us and his promises. We don't believe God wants us to have the knowledge we need and we don't trust him that he has and will enable us to find it. In this current climate, there are loads of complex questions being asked that we don't readily have the answers to, and we can't just bury our head in the sand. The least we can do is to take our question before the Lord and let him tell us if, if this is urgent to know or not. You know, maybe this is not something that needs to be done now, but we need to know that from him. We are warned that we will fall in the fray if we don't know where we stand on the word of truth. And that's assuming we're serious about being one of the people who will stand through the times of trouble that seem could even be just around the corner. Question, are you serious about having your answers today? Or do you think you'll get more serious about it when it becomes more of an issue? And you don't need to start the serious Bible study just now. While you fail to do your own work, you are vulnerable. I'm telling you, you're vulnerable to anyone else who is passionate and prepared about sharing their understanding that they have gained through the studies they've done. I can tell you when you are presented with some shocking facts that you haven't yet thought about and determined where you stand on, you will be at a loss of words to reason from the word by all means be open and listen we will we will be willing to consider to go away and enlist the help of the holy spirit to guide but it is the truth that god wants you to hold on to and that you need to hear it for yourself from his word so now let's turn to john chapter 14 verse 25 and 26 
see what the Bible tells us. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So there it is, direct from Jesus. His method involves prayer, brethren, prayer to know what to study and where to find the answers. We can't just think, oh, I do a Bible study every day, open the Bible, I'm going chapter by chapter. We need to get into a thought process with God because the questions that are coming to us, he will direct us to where to find the answers. So prayer to know what to study and where to find the answers. God wants to supply this to you. Is it all too demanding for us to take out this purposeful time to pray and study? Because we have so many other demands on our time. Of course, it's easier to watch a YouTube sermon whilst we're at least doing something else. But can we afford to leave the important work that seems it will decide our future into the hands of someone else? What That is what we are doing when we don't take responsibility to ourselves, do our part to enable God to have a living, working relationship with us. Now, Ellen White said in Testimonies to the Church, 111, Chapter 1, it made her sad to think and know we lose sight of the fullness of blessing designed for us. We content ourselves with momentary flashes of spiritual illumination when we walk, when we might walk day after day in the light of his presence. Brethren, we no longer have the luxury of just thinking that would be wonderful but not doing anything actively on our part to make it happen. We need to do this. We need to, we need to be working in our lives already and not just, we need this working in our lives, not on rare occasions. God needs to be invited more and more into our thinking, into our daily thoughts. So we're now going to look at testimonies to the church, 111, chapter 2 where she says, dear brethren, dear brethren, pray as you never prayed before for beams from the sun of righteousness to shine upon the word that you may be able to understand its true meaning. Jesus pleaded with the disciples that they might be sanctified through the truth, the word of God then how earnestly should we pray that he who searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God, he whose office it is to bring all things into remembrance of God's people and to guide them into all truth, may be with us in the investigation of his holy word. Now looking, I want to look at the moment when Jesus met Nathaniel for the first time. This was the exchange that took place between them. It's in John chapter 1, verse 47 to 49. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. Now, Jesus already knew Nathanael before meeting him. How was that? Think about how could Jesus in his human form know Nathanael before he'd actually met him? Because Jesus, being God, heard his prayers to God under the fig tree. Jesus will also know us when we get to know him through our prayers under our fig tree. Prayers that lead us to where to find him in the word. Ellen White comments on those verses. She said in Testimonies 1.10, paragraph 2, Jesus will also see us in the secret places of prayer 
if we seek him for the light that we may know what is truth. Now, <clears throat> I return again to the question I asked in the beginning. How much time do you think you have to verify the truth that you don't have a good understanding of right now? Do you have a bit of room for deviation from the straight truth? I beg to differ. We are already in need of more time than we have available if the truth is known. Time is already too short and we need to make this adjustment in our lives right now. Some of you might diligently give time each week to do proper Bible study, but I'm talking to myself here as well as maybe some other people. If you're like me, you're beset with distractions. The devil knows just what works with each one of us to get our focus off what is most needed. And instead of, instead of listening to all the interesting things that other people have to say on anything and everything, we need to now focus. We need to focus in. I heard a preacher say recently, if we're addicted to our smartphones, we won't make it to heaven. Now, that's a sobering thought. That really is. We don't have time for this. We need a true and deeper knowledge of the Bible that we can, excuse me, that we can be confident it is correct. Our, our truth that we're standing on is correct. And that, that comes through the help and conviction of the Holy Spirit not through other people's knowledge. The knowledge may be inspired to them. Maybe it was given them by God. But it's when we take what we hear to the word of God to find it out for ourselves that we gain the power that we need to live by it as well. It's not enough to read and gain knowledge. We need the power that is inside those words written in his book. The power available to us is, is living inside the words. A quote from Gospel Workers says, in the great conflict before us, he who would, in the great conflict before us, he who would keep true to Christ must penetrate deeper than the opinions and doctrines of men. My message to ministers, young and old, is this. Guard jealously your hours for prayer, Bible study, and self-examination. Set aside a portion of each day for a study of the scriptures and communion with God. Thus you will obtain spiritual strength and will grow in favor with God. He alone can give you noble aspirations. He alone can fashion character after the divine similitude. Draw near to him in earnest prayer and he will fill your hearts with high and holy purposes and with deep earnest longings for purity and clearness of thought. That was Gospel Workers 100, paragraph 1. And the power also to enable this is in the reading and living out of what you learn. So I want to now turn to the Bible. This is the scripture that we had a scripture reading. It's in Paul's words to the Colossians. And I'll just repeat again for you. It's chapter four, Colossians chapter four. If you have your Bible, please open with me. Colossians chapter four, verse two. And it says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am in, also in bonds, that I may make manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know that, that the how ye ought to answer every man. So it takes knowledge, it takes prayer of of the word of God to understand the knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Yeah, that's what Paul said. It takes knowledge of the word to understand the mystery before you take it outside to other people. So what is the mystery of, of God? What is the mystery of Christ? 
I think you probably all know that. The mystery of the mystery of Christ is the mystery of holiness. That's that's Christ within us. The mystery is the change that happens inside us when we feed on and do as we learn in the word. We become like him. Brethren, we aren't going where we want to go if this process isn't happening in us. It's not about merely getting knowledge. It's a whole process where we change. The roughness is polished down. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 7, and I haven't um, put this on a slide, so I would encourage you to open up your Bible and read it with me. It's a good thing to open up pages, isn't it? Not just always grab a device. If you have your Bible, let's read Titus chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. And it says in Titus chapter 2, Verse 7 and 8. And it says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. And I want to just read that last verse again. So it's saying, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Think about that. It cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Now, this brings me to my final point. When you discuss important challenges about the Bible, about doctrine, about anything that you don't know where you stand on it. When you're faced with an, within a position where you need to agree or disagree or say something, stick to the only source of truth that you can stand on without being knocked off. The only source that people cannot argue with is the word of God and the spirit of prophecy. So I would advise you when it comes to working out truth together, let's stick to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy only. These as a source we can stand on and nobody can, people can turn things around. We're all capable of that. I just want to share something with you because in the um, Sabbath school lesson, we had a text that came up and I thought this was quite um appropriate as well and that was 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2 if you have your bible look for 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 2 and this morning we were reading this it says but have renounced it's talking about people looking at the word but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse three, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So these verses also are telling us, even if we stick to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy alone, there is a wrong way and a right way to handle the word, word of God. And every one of us could be guilty of deciding a where we stand first. This is what I think. And now let me go find the verses to back that up. Let me go and find all the verses that stand by my point. But the main issue here is, instead of doing that, first of all, you have to come to the word in a humble position of faith, faith that allows God to lead you into the truth. When you're sure you still stand on it, that's fine. But you must be led by God, not not choose an issue and decide and say, this is what I think. It has to be God led direction. And don't be led by the thoughts of others, no matter how impressive their speech may be. Just trust in God. He will lead us. OK, so. I think I've covered that. The the main thing is really stick to the two things that we can't we can't be faulted on when we stick to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. 
And the final text I'll share with you is Isaiah 8, chapter 8, verse 20, which reminds us to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Amen. Stick to those. So now in wrapping up, to the title of my sermon, You and Only You. What did I mean by you and only you? Brothers and sisters, it is you. It is you and only you who can decide to put the time in your day, to put the time that you need to make yourself ready in a relationship with Jesus. We all want it. We all, we're in, we're in, this faith we're in this church because we profess to want that but are we fooling ourselves it's only us that can make the decision to do it it's the holy spirit and only the holy spirit who can respond to us giving us the real knowledge and understanding to enable us to grow and finally it is jesus and only jesus who will call us saying Come, I know you. And why will he call us? He will say, come, because I know you. Because he will know you personally and intimately. And you will know him. And this will be because through conversations you've taken, the initiative to have with him will mean that he'll call you. May we all, brothers and sisters, be blessed when we endeavor to put this into practice. And may God help us to make it happen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, please help us, Lord. We need you to be the answer to all of our questionings. We can't afford it, Lord. We cannot afford to be swayed here and there to the left and the right. We don't have time, Lord. The path is narrow. And Sister White saw many people falling off the path. And she saw brothers and sisters trying to hold on to them, Lord. But sometimes they, they couldn't. Lord, help us to see the goal ahead. Help us, help us to recognize our weakness and to turn to you to overcome it so that we can stay focused on the goal. We want to be there, Lord. We want to be with you in heaven. We want to rejoice when you come back because we're going with you. We want to experience the thousand years of bliss because we've suffered long enough in a short life. We put our salvation in your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>